In January 2015, actor and comedian Stephen Fry was asked a question about how he would respond if he died and met God. Stephen Fry responded and the response went viral. I say, bone cancer in children? What's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. Because the God who created this universe, if it was created by God, is quite clearly a maniac. Totally. We have to spend our life on our knees thanking him? What kind of God would do that? Yes, the world is very splendid, but it also has in it insects whose whole life cycle is to burrow into the eyes of children and make them blind. They eat outwards from the eyes. Why? Why did you do that to us? You could easily have made a creation in which that didn't exist. See, Stephen Fry is an atheist. He doesn't believe in God. And yet to respond to this question, he had to create a picture of God in his mind that he could respond to. It's a harsh, cruel picture of God. It's the God that Stephen Fry doesn't believe in. But it's also the God that Christian Giles Fraser doesn't believe in. In his article, Giles Fraser writes the following. The other problem with Fry's argument is philosophical. Simply put, there is no such thing as the God he imagines. It is the flying teapot orbiting a distant planet about which nothing can be said. Such a God doesn't exist. For decades, people have created pictures of the God they don't believe in. Some of them are like Stephen Fry's God, harsh, uncaring. Each week, we'll be looking at a different picture of God that people have and considering it and what the Bible says. Well, if you're a Christian, perhaps you've encountered some of these images of God. Perhaps some of your friends have this image of God in their mind as the God they don't believe in. Perhaps you're not sure how to respond when they ask you hard questions about God. Well, what if you're not a Christian? Perhaps one of these images of God is the God that you don't believe in. Perhaps you've thought, even if there is a God, I'd never worship that God because that God must be violent or homophobic or arrogant or intolerant. Perhaps you get frustrated because you think Christians are misrepresenting the God that must exist if there is one. Well, regardless of who you are, this is a great series to be at, to consider some of these images of God in a helpful, deep and real way and to avoid perhaps some unfair stereotype images of God. Welcome to the series, The God I Don't Believe In. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy, and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground, than he blows on them and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the, cre the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Hey, good evening, everybody, and um, lovely to be sharing with you. Um, I, I'm on a sermon marathon, so this is um, my seventh mess, my fifth mess, mess my fifth message in seven days. So uh, for those of you that have been with me for the last seven days and maybe this is your first, fifth sermon from me, I do apologise. <laughs> I preached last Sunday morning, then Sunday night, then Monday morning I had the wedding, I preached this morning and then and now tonight. So um, 
it's, uh, it's been a bit of a, a marathon week, but hopefully some things I'll say tonight will, uh, will make sense to you. Now, um, this series that we've been doing, uh, there's a number of different issues that we're looking at. Some of them are going to be more pertinent to you than others. So uh, tonight, maybe you might think, yeah, this is not really an issue for me. I you know, don't have an issue with science and faith or whatever. That, that's okay. Uh, but you might hear something or learn something that might help you help someone else who this is a bit of a, a roadblock to faith with. Uh, so hang in there, even if it's kind of not, you know, like as Stefan shared, it seems to be immediately pertinent to him. Uh, and in and his life at the moment. And that may not be you, but it's an important topic for a lot of people and it might be helpful to be able to help them later on by listening. Um, I remember uh, many years ago when I was 19 and I was driving along in my HQ Holden station wagon, uh, which was painted bright orange with a, with a fence paint brush and I think it was just house paint. It was held together by bog, so it had been crashed so many times that it was basically held together by by bog and painted over with orange paint with a big thick brush. It was a great car, got it for 800 bucks. Um, the guy wanted 1500, but my cousin Manuel, uh, who was a, a bit of a, a barter guy, he, he, he just came in at an offer for 800. I got it for 800. I would have paid 1500 for it, but anyway, that's beside the point. Um, I'm driving along in my HQ Holden station wagon, and uh, I'm not a Christian. I, I kind of never been to church really, except when my Greek yaya dragged me into church twice at Christmas, and um, I'm driving along and I look and there's this beautiful lake, um, it was West Lakes in Adelaide, and uh, there's the sun shining on the water, it was glistening, all the green grass and the trees, there was people around walking their dogs, there was people windsurfing on the lake, this gl- blue sky, glorious, glorious day, and I'm driving and in my heart I just go, there must be a God there must be someone responsible for all this beauty and all of this glory that I'm seeing. There must be someone responsible. And from that point on, I actually started to pray. I kept a prayer journal. Um, After a few months, I burnt it uh, (laughs) because I was worried that (laughs) my family might find it and think I'd gone mad. Um, And that was the beginning of my faith journey. And eventually I met some Christian people, um, or they met me actually, and started to share with me about this creator about this God that I'd just come to believe in, in a general sense, and they shared with me more specifically who he was and um, that he was uh, at work in the person of Jesus in a very powerful way. Now, um, I'm going to say a few things tonight which will be... um, uh, well, I can't cover, there's, there's a lot of stuff in this topic that, that won't be covered, so I'll just put that straight out there. But a few premises. Uh, science is brilliant, premise one, an essential, an essential tool to discover how the world and the universe is structured. So science is a, is a wonderful tool to um, ascertain you know, the nature of our world and the universe. Premise number two, science is not able to explain why the universe is structured, nor if there is any purpose or meaning in life. So science can't do that. Um, And that's not a bad thing, it's just not part of the tool of the scientific methodology. Uh, Premise three, theology, study of God or faith and religion, and philosophy are useful and necessary pursuits for humanity to seek answers to those questions that lie out of the reach of science. Premise number four, there is no conflict between science and faith in God, or there need not be, even though culturally there's kind of a battle that plays out, which you may have seen in memes like these. (laughs) Give you a moment to have a look. These go around internet and Facebook and, and people on both sides of this, um, this issue throw up memes like this and can I just encourage you again, don't use memes. <laughs> it's, it's just ridiculous um, and especially if you're a follower of Jesus or a Christian, look, I may have been sucked in here or there with the odd meme, I do apologise, but it's not really gracious to construe people who don't believe in God as idiots. Uh, there are many um, genuine and good-hearted people who are atheists who, who are seeking to understand the world, and it's just not helpful from a Christian point of view to pop up memes which 
belittle them. Now, okay, fair enough. There are plenty of memes which belittle people of faith, and, uh, and we just kind of wear that. Um, but don't buy into it. Don't use memes because it's not going not to help in any way. Now, um, they're my uh, premise, premises, premises that I used before, and um, I'll post them online tomorrow if you want to sort of follow them up. Now, I need to say I'm a pastor. I'm not a scientist. Though I was a chef, and uh, that might count, I don't know, but um, <laughs> there is a science to cooking. Uh, there are some really brilliant people in this field who you can uh, kind of engage with if, if you just look these people up. Alistair McGrath, uh, he, he was an atheist, and he's a, a PhD in biology, uh, became a, a follower of Christ, and now is, and got a PhD in theology, and now he's professor of science and religion at the University of Oxford, just little sort of campus down the road somewhere. Um, John Lennox, uh, professor of mathematics at Oxford. These guys are really getting into the very high level, very complex arguments and, and issues around science and faith. And if you're really into it, you need to read these guys, you need to hear from them. There's plenty of stuff on the internet. Nancy Murphy writes about, um, full of seminary, about the, the philosophy of science. William Lane Craig, uh, again, around the philosophy of science and arguments for God. The, these people are, are who you really need to look to. Um, though as a pastor, I can pray for you. Um, now, I can do a few more things too. Uh, let me go through a, a few um, points here. I'm not going to deal with that one yet. Um, science had its beginning, interestingly enough, the, the early roots of modern science um, kind of was, was birthed out of a, a Christ, Christological or Christian worldview. Uh, and uh, this might surprise uh, people today, uh, probably would surprise Stefan's lecturer, but um, the, uh, most of the early scientists shared a Christian worldview or a theistic worldview. That is, they believed in, in a creator God, not necessarily, um, you know, Christ as God, but this was the general worldview. Melvin Calvin, uh, he's a Nobel Prize winner in biochemistry, and, and he writes about the historical foundation of modern science being traced to the ancient Hebrew or Jewish discovery or belief in one God. That monotheism was the important basis on which the modern scientific movement began, that the universe is governed by a single God. Uh, Robert Oppenheimer, he's an American theoretical physicist, professor of physics. He's not a Christian, but he also writes about the Christian worldview and the cradle that that was in giving birth to modern science. Sir Alfred North Whitehead is an eminent mathematician and historian of science, or so he's deceased now. He observed that modern science came from the medieval insistence on the rationality of God. And C.S. Lewis expands this a little bit and says, men, we can say women, men and women, became scientific because they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. So the, the premise that the universe and the world is rational and that we can discover laws in it came from a view that there was a rational lawgiver who brought this universe into existence. Francis Bacon, the father of modern science, taught that God has given us two books, nature which the scientific method studies, and the Bible. We should give our minds to studying both. Some of the towering figures of modern science, Galileo, Johann Kepler, Blaise Pascal, Robert Boyle, Isaac Newton, Michael Faraday, Charles Babbage, Gregor Mendel, Louis Pasteur, Lord Kelvin, James Clerk Maxwell, were all theists. They all believed in a creator God, and many of them were Christians. So the thought that somehow science has dispelled or, or made redundant and ridiculous a view in the belief of God kind of is, is counterintuitive in that it was people with that view who kind of grew into this flowering movement that became science as we know it today. Um, Isaac Newton argued that the regulation of the solar system presupposed, these are his words, the council and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. This is Isaac Newton, no sort of uh, Johnny-come-lately to science. 
Um, also extensive surveys, they did major surveys about uh, in 1916 on how many working scientists uh, in the US uh, believed in a personal God. This was 1916 statistics. 40% believed uh, in, uh, well, didn't believe in a personal God. 20% were agnostic and 40% did believe in a personal God. They repeated the survey 80 years later in about 1997 and found similar statistics that of working scientists in the US, about 40% didn't believe in a personal God, 40% did, and 20% were agnostic. It just kind of hadn't changed over 80 years. So there's clearly people who ha have an atheist worldview and a theistic worldview that operate functionally and well in the scientific endeavour and fields of science. Francis Collins um, was, is an eminent scientist in, in the US, and I'll talk about him a little bit later about his background, but um, he, he was a, a very strong atheist and a scientist. He was a medical doctor at this time in his early 20s. And he said, the science I loved so much was powerless to answer questions such as why is, what is the meaning of life? Why am I here? Why does mathematics work anyway? If the universe had a beginning, who created it? Why are the physical constants in the universe so finely tuned as to allow the possibility of complex life forms? Why do humans have a moral sense? And what happens after we die? And he said this took him on a bit of a journey, a bit of a, um, a challenge. It actually happened one day when one of his patients who was dying asked him and said, Doctor, what do you believe about life and death? Kind of sent him on a journey, which I'll talk about in a moment. Now, just quickly, I want to give you an overview because I'm no expert in these arguments. I don't fully comprehend them myself, but there are some very uh, gifted and uh, smart people over many, many years and in sometimes centuries have espoused these arguments for the existence of God or an intelligent creator, call that being what you wish. The cosmological argument from contingency. Put your hand up if that's your favourite. Okay, got a few devotees here tonight. Um, and it basically goes something like this. Everything, this is from uh, Professor William Lane Craig. Everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or in an external cause. So the necessity of its own nature is something like a number, the number three. It just kind of is. It doesn't necessarily have an external cause. It just exists um, as, a, as a reality. But then something like um, a fish or a, a living being uh, didn't just create itself. It has an external cause of some form. If the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God or must be God. Now, the universe exists, therefore the universe has an explanation of its existence, therefore the explanation of the universe's existence is God. Does that make sense? You got that? Anyway, you can follow up on the, on the <laughs> argument um, from cos the cosmological argument, um, but it, it's deeply complex and moves from those basic premises. The second one is, is a little bit similar but different. The Kalam cosmological argument based on the beginning of the universe. Now, Kalam is the Arabic word for theology or the study of God because this was propounded by uh, Muslim scientists centuries ago and has been... Uh, still today, there are people who... Uh, study and uh, propound this argument for God's existence. Uh, everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. And they argue from those three uh, premises. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. No one disputes that. Therefore, the universe has a cause. The physicist um, Paul Davies, who's, who's not a theist and not a Christian, he says this, the coming into being of the universe as discussed in modern science is not just a matter of imposing some sort of organisation upon a previous incoherent state, but literally the coming into being of all physical things from nothing. 
Now, how do we explain that? Well, this argument says that everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, and they propose the cause of that existence is God or, or a great and intelligent being. Now, the third one is the moral argument based on objective moral values and duties. If God does not exist, goes the argument, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists. Now, that's a very simplified statement of the argument, but it's basically saying... Um, well, moral duties uh, are things which are right or wrong. Moral values are things that are good or bad. The morally good or bad is determined by God's nature and the morally right or wrong is determined by his will. God wills something because he is good and something is right because God wills it. And fourthly, there's the teleological argument from fine-tuning. Um, and again, uh, atheists, uh, physicists and whatever and, and others who are, who are agnostic acknowledge fine-tuning in the universe. And the argument goes like this. The fine-tuning of the universe is due e either to physical necessity, it's always been like that, chance, hey, it just happened, how about that, or design. It's not due to physical necessity or chance, they seem the lesser arguments. Therefore, it is due to design. And Stephen Hawking, uh, one of the great scientists of our age, uh, says this, our universe and its laws appear to have a design that both is tailor-made to support us and, if we are to, to exist, leaves little room for alteration. That is not easily explained. And it raises the natural question of why it is that way. The extreme fine-tuning of so many of the laws of nature could lead at least some of us back to the old idea that this grand design is the work of some grand designer. So Stephen Hawking says... When you look at it, when you understand the content, constants of the universe, the fine-tuning, yes, it really looks like it should be created by a designer, but actually it's not. There's no God. Now, eminent theoretical physicist Professor John Polkinghorne from Cambridge University, I think, he says this, and he is a, a Christian, a possible explanation of equal intellectual respectability to the fine-tuning and to my mind, greater economy and elegance would be that this one world is the way it is, fine-tuned and all, because it is the creation of the will of a creator who purposes that it should be so. So eminent and, and very bright science, scientists look at the same situation and come to two very different conclusions. Now, let me just run through a couple of things. Um, I want to look at the mind and consciousness. Now, I've always wanted to do this experiment. I don't know what it proves. It probably doesn't prove anything, but I just want you to help me here because I've kind of dreamed of doing this, and I want you to help me if you wouldn't mind. It won't, no one will get hurt in this experiment. Um, I do have ethical clearance uh, from the BV, but um, Baptist Union of Victoria. Now, what I want you to do, if, if you wouldn't mind, uh, again, it's, it's, it's a voluntary thing, just close your eyes, okay? Just, yeah, like that. Close your eyes. And um, now, I want you to imagine that you, in your mind, you can see an elephant. I want you to picture an elephant. Now, with your eyes closed, I want you to put your hand up if you can see an elephant. Okay, thank you. That's the experiment over. <laughs> That's it. Oh, there's a little bit more. Um, where, who saw an elephant? Now, where does that elephant exist? Like, as in, 
you, you, you really saw an elephant, right? You, you really saw an elephant in your mind. If your mind is just, uh, your, if your mind is essentially a function of your brain, a chemical function, where, where did the, the image of that elephant, where does it exist? Where is it? Does it have any weight? Does it, can, can we test for it? Can we, um, can we somehow use the scientific method to confirm that you actually had an elephant appear in the lump of meat we call your brain? Um, does it have any physical properties, the elephant you saw? But you all believe you saw an elephant, right, in your mind. But where? where? Whereabouts? And this leads me to my point here um, that one of the issues with naturalism, the belief that there is just physical life and physical reality, is the problem of consciousness and, and mind. And I used to struggle with this before I was a Christian. I used to think of, how come I can say this is my arm? Who, who, who is my? Who is this I? Who is this inner being, this inner person that is me, that is not separate from my body, but can, can somehow lay claim to that is my arm. So having consciousness, having personal identity inward made me feel like I'm, I'm more than just a physical body. I'm a being. There's something alive inside here, consciousness. And one of the things I think that as we discover more about our world, I think, and, and others think this as well who are much smarter than me, but I think that naturalism uh, and, and the atheistic worldview is is actually a, an acid that begins to, to eat itself up. And, and I'll, I'll quote from um, J.B.S. Haldane, who was a chemist from, from many years ago, and he says this, if the thoughts in my mind are just the motions of atoms in my brain, that is, they have purely a chemical material function, okay, that the brain is just a material chemical uh, reality, if the thoughts there are just motions of atoms in my brain, a mechanism that has arisen by mindless, unguided processes, why should I believe anything it tells me? How could I trust my mind if it's the result of millions and millions of years of unguided, and I'm paraphrasing, mindless processes? Why should I believe anything it tells me, including the fact that it is made of atoms? And then Professor Alvin Plantinga, who's from the University of Notre Dame in America, a very, um, very good writer in these sorts of areas, uh, he, he says this, if Richard Dawkins is right and we are the product of mindless, unguided, natural processes, then he has given us strong reason to doubt the reliability of human cognitive faculties and therefore inevitably to doubt the validity of any belief that is produced by the mind, including Richard Dawkins' own science and his atheism. So in a sense, if you trace the, 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 the reality of naturalism and materialism down the rabbit hole far enough, you get to a point where you say, if unguided, mindless processes produced this, how can I trust it? How can I place any value? Now, there are obviously counter-arguments, and I'm not doing that very much justice to put it in such, um, I guess, simple and basic terms, but consciousness and the mind are a bit of a dilemma. I recently read something from Dawkins where he just straight, Richard Dawkins says straight out, I don't know what consciousness is. We don't really know what consciousness is other than we kind of have it. You could see the elephant, but we don't know how, we don't know where the elephant is, we don't know how that works. Anyway, DNA, this is my second point. The complexity of the cell DNA. Now, when, when Charles Darwin kind of proposed his theory, I'm not getting into evolution tonight, but there may be some questions. Um, I guess he, he thought at the time, as, as many did, that the cell was, was a very primitive and very basic unit of life, the human cell. It was just like, blah. It's just a lump. It's the most basic building block of life, the cell. It divides in two cells. Yeah, go cell. And then, you know, it kind of moves into an organism. And yet, as, we've, as science has developed, and we've developed technology and, and ways of looking into the cell, we now know that that's not the case at all. 
Now, what I'm about to say is not an argument for the existence of God. It's not an argument uh, for Christianity. It's an argument to take seriously that we can't just say science has answered all the questions and eradicated all mystery. There are three billion letters in the human genome. uh, And in each of your cells is a strand of DNA. And it has three billion bits of information. And that's a lot of information. They're they're sort of, um, they're coded by four letters, A, C, G, T. And they carry the instructions to make all living organisms. The human genome, if you wrote it out, would stretch 9,000 kilometres. And and this is in your cell, and you have about 100 trillion cells. So in one of your cells, if you stretch out the DNA, if you could write it out, it would stretch 9,000 kilometres. Okay. If, if you were to type the DNA out eight hours a day, it would take you 50 years to type out the DNA in one of your cells. Um, if you were to read out the DNA code in your cell every day, 24 hours a day, it would take you 100 years to read out the DNA that is in each of your cells and my cells too. The human body has 100 trillion cells, and each cell has a copy of those 3, 000, 3, 3 billion letters. So times 100 trillion by 3 billion bits of information, that's who you are, that's who I am. Now, I think that's, I think that's amazing, and I've just got a little demonstration here tonight. Um, so I, I've actually uh, written out the DNA code. So Dave, can you give me a hand for a sec? Can you... Um, Fold that back. I actually haven't. Can you take that back as far as you can? I'll hold this bit. So this is, um, what I've done here is, uh, this is 50 pages of DNA, okay? Now this, to actually get your DNA in one of your cells written out properly, you would need a million pages, okay? So I've done 50, I've just typed it. I cut and paste, I did a shortcut. Um, <laughs> because I, I did have a lot to do this week. And um, so that, that's like, that's 50 pages, but in each of your cells is uh, one million pages of information. Now, I'm going to use an argument from John Lennox, who I uh, showed before, Professor John Lennox, and, and he says this. He says, uh, if you went to a cave, you're, you're an archaeologist and, um, or an anthropologist, and you went to a cave uh, in China, and um, you're looking around, and you, you saw that up on the cave wall. Okay, it's, the, it's a Chinese symbol for God, one of them. Uh, if you saw that, you might think, that's an interesting formation there. Um, I wonder if some creature made that, or some kind of... Who knows, but it's just an interesting thing. And your Chinese guide says, hang on, do you know what that is? They're the two Chinese characters for God. And John, John Lennox says... If, if you said to your guide, oh, well, they just arose probably over you know, millions and millions of years and, and appeared on the wall, they'd probably laugh at you and go, oh, it's ridiculous. Like, clearly, that's, that's been written. There's an agent. There's, there's, there's some, some intelligence behind producing these two figures because they have meaning. They, they are semiotic. They convey meaning to me if you understand the code. Now, John Lennox then says, okay, imagine let's now go to the lab and we've just identified the three billion letters of the human DNA and um, you say to someone, well, clearly there must be some sort of intelligence behind this because it's coded, it has to be in a certain sequence, Uh, it's a language. DNA is effectively the longest word in the human, um, human community, I guess, three billion letters. Now, if, if two symbols is enough to convince most reasonable people, two symbols that have meaning in the Chinese language, that, well, obviously someone must have done this because meaning and language don't just appear. Information, you know, needs to be uh, given by someone in this way. If, if most people would believe for two symbols that we need... Um, we need someone to produce this. Is it, is it ridiculous to say, well, we've got three billion symbols here, three billion bits of information 
a three billion letter long word, is it ignorant or stupid or idiotic to believe that perhaps there is some type of intelligence behind this, that there is actually someone who wrote this code? Now let me finish up. Anthony Flew, Anthony Flew, long before Richard Dawkins was a poster boy for atheism and, and Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett and Christopher Hitchens, Anthony, Anthony Flew was the guy, um, the atheism go-to guy for like four or five decades. He died a few years back. And um, he, he wrote so many books on atheism, so many articles. He, he, was, he was an expert on David Hume who argued against miracles and so on. Now, this is what, what he says. He actually, at the end of his life, came to believe in, in God, or at least uh, an intelligent being. He says, I now believe the universe was brought into existence by an infinite intelligence, that this universe's intricate laws manifest what scientists have called the mind of God. I believe that life and reproduction originate in a divine source. And one of the reasons why was this. He wrote this a little bit earlier. It now seems to me that the findings of more than 50 years of DNA the chemical inside the nucleus of a cell that carries the genetic instructions for making living, living organisms, that DNA research have provided materials for a new and enormous, enormous, enormously powerful argument to design. He says, now, now that we, we see the cell, now that we've seen more, this is even a more powerful argument for design. Now let me finish um, and we'll go to some questions, and I'm sure there'll be many. Um, Dr. Francis Collins, and I talked about him earlier. He was actually the leader of the, the Human Genome Project. He was uh, in, instrumental in the coding of the human uh, genome. He was, he was leading that team in America, an eminent physician and geneticist. And, and he, he wrote this, as a director of the Human Genome Project, I have led a consortium of scientists from around the world to read out the three billion letters of the human genome, our own DNA instruction book. As a believer, I see DNA, the information molecule of all living things, as God's language, and the elegance and complexity of our own bodies and the rest of nature as a reflection of God's plan. And he came to faith when he began to ask those questions I said earlier, and he said this, talking about Jesus. He was a person with a remarkably strong historical evidence of his life, who made astounding statements about loving your neighbour, and whose claims about being God's son seemed to demand a decision about whether he was deluded or the real thing. After resisting for nearly two years, I, f I found it impossible to go on living in such a state of uncertainty, and I became a follower of Jesus. And let me read finally from Colossians which makes a claim about who Jesus is. That not just there's an intelligent creator God, but that this intelligent creator God is actually one with Jesus and, and Jesus is part of the Godhead who created all things. This is Paul in Colossians 1. Jesus, um, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in Jesus, and through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. It's an astounding statement. It's a statement which says the creator God, the one true God, came to this earth and died for us, that we might be restored and forgiven and healed from our rebellion and our sinfulness. Incredible, you may say, but perhaps it might be true. Let's go to some questions. Dave, um, we're going to do this a little bit different tonight. Dave, you got the phone. Um, if you come up here and... Um, so Dave's going to call out questions. Can you use that mic, Dave? Um, Simon, Dave, will use this one. Um, Paul, can you give us a hand to um, do the... You take that one. Do the questions, because we're going to open it up tonight and do a bit of a scientific thing. There was a microphone there. Oh, Dave, you got it. So... We're going to pull our knowledge tonight, just for the next five or ten minutes, 
And if you want to answer one of the questions, just put your hand up if you feel like you want to have a go at it and perhaps you're studying medicine, science, biology, something, and you want to have a stab at it, uh, we want you to be involved in this. So it's, it's kind of a bit of a scientific pooling of knowledge here. So Dave, if you kick off with the questions, and then put your hand up if you want to have a go at it, and Paul will come to you with the mic, but wait till the mic comes. Um, try and be straight to the point, and not to necessarily answer questions with other questions, though sometimes it happens. Let's go. All right. So the first question, what is your take on evolution and how do you reconcile it with the creation story in Genesis? Yeah, I kind of thought that one would come up first. Um, <laughs> I've got some thoughts. Anyone want to comment on that? How do you reconcile evolution with Genesis 1 to 3? Great. Well, let me say this. Um, Sheila? Paul, down here. Thanks, Sheila. Wait till the mic comes, Sheila. I'm reading it. Sorry. Um, I'm reading an interesting book at the moment by somebody called Elizabeth Johnson. She's both a scientist and um, a theologian. And she's looking at the, a dialogue between science and theology. And her comments were that there are four ways you can look at it. One is ignoring the other. So, all right, I just pretend, put them both in two different boxes and ignore them. The second one is that I conflict. So I say that one disproves the other and I see them in conflict. The third one, which is what the book is about, is the dialogue between the two. So she spends some time both talking about science and talking about theology. She does not, and she emphasizes that dialogue does not mean using selected bits of one to try and prove or disprove the other. Her fourth one, which she's not getting into at this point, and I'm only halfway through the book, is synthesizing the two and attempting to say, you know, one is, and this is how it fits in. Uh, that's a little bit of a moving feast mm. because science is constantly changing and learning. That's great. That, that's, you that, might that find the book interesting yeah. to take it to the next stage. Thanks, Sheila. There, there are four good categories that, that we can deal on evolution and creation, but um, I think I'd just say firstly that it's not an article of faith to believe in creation, a seven-day creation. Now, that's not saying you can't believe in that, but I'm just saying it's not an issue of salvation. It, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't really affect the claims of Jesus Christ uh, if God created in seven literal days or seven uh, metaphorical days, which, which might mean a long time. There's essentially four positions that I think Christians can hold and, and still be Christians. That's short earth creationism, God created the earth in seven days. Uh, long earth creationism, that the universe is billions of years old and the earth can be billions of years old, and, but God still created from nothing. Um, thirdly, there's intelligent design which may or not presuppose uh, a creator God, but just presupposes that there is some intelligence behind uh, the, the universe. And most Christians who hold that would, of course, believe that to be God. And the fourth one is theistic evolution. So that's, that's uh, Christian people who believe that uh, God used evolution and guided evolution in order to bring about life. So, you know, I, I don't think you have to get too pent up. I, I'm not too keen on, on perhaps people who really fight the battle on, no, it has to be a seven-day creation or everything else falls apart. Look, I'm not sure that's true. I, I kind of think I'm probably more of a long-earth creationist sort of guy. Um, I think the universe is billions of years old, the earth is very old, and God created from nothing. But um, it, it shouldn't be something that becomes an article of faith that you have to hold this view to be a real Christian. Um, there are good um, Christians on on each of those sort of categories. Yeah. I was going to ask you another similar question, but I think you pretty much answered it. So, on to the next one. Can the imperfect nature of humans, in terms of sickness and disease, etc., 
be attributed to science or God? Is there something that can be blamed or something that we can use to explain the fallible nature of human life and the universe? Sure, does anyone want to go at that? What's, where does the infallible or the... Infallible, is that the word they use? Uh, fallible, yeah. Fallible, sorry. Like, where does brokenness or, or fallibility in human beings come from? Someone have a go at that? Anita, I see that hand. Um, maybe this is a bit obvious, but for me, the sickness of humans, I think, is an outworking of sin. Um, and I would say that when sin came into the world, the whole of creation was affected, um, not just in terms of the actions that we do, but also in terms of the very nature of the world. Um, and I think the nature of the human body and the fact that it does break down, I would say that that is probably not, it's probably an impact of sin. I would say, um, and in terms of heaven, that gives me real hope that there will one day be a time where sickness um, and the fallibility of the human body will no longer be the way it is. Yeah. That's what I always said. I like it. Um, I just kind of add too that when you have this conversation with people like Stefan's, was it George Mucci? Was his name? George Mucci? Um, just not, not as a thing to try and catch them out, but um, it's not just Christians that have to answer these questions. So if your atheist friend or whatever goes, well, where's all the suffering come from, whatever, that's a, that's a fair question, and I think Christians have good answers or reasonable responses to that, but, but ask them, as an atheist, why do you think human beings are fallible? Why do you think there's so much suffering in the world? Why do you think there's sickness? Don't feel you're on the fence all the time, because each worldview really has to respond to these questions. It's not just to say to a Christian, well, how can there be a loving God if there's so much suffering? That's a really great question. People have written millions of books about it. It's, it's a difficult one. But so as an atheist, why do you think there's so much suffering? And, and have a dialogue, have a conversation, and don't always be on the defensive, but seek to draw them out. Well, what's, what do you think about suffering? And um, why do you think there's so much suffering? And go from there. Let's go for one or two more and then we'll finish up. All right, well, I'm getting, I know we've touched on Genesis, but I'm getting a couple questions in about it, so we'll go back to it, I guess. So um, I took Genesis out of the talk, I didn't have enough yeah. time. But. So I guess I'll make it a two part um, question. So, given that science uh, seems so strong that the Earth is billions of years old, mm. um, why do you think some Christians are so attached to the literal creation story? Um, and part B, um, how do we then um, understand Genesis without undermining its truth? Yeah, that's a good question. Look, can I, can I, I don't want to de deflect it, but can I just say, um, I'd, I'd like to post some stuff about this on the Facebook page tomorrow, uh, specifically about Genesis, about the seven days, and, and, um, and that might be the way to go about it, so you can have some material to look at and work through. Um, yeah, just quickly on the first point, why it's such a big issue for some people. I think that the feeling is that, well, if you, if you don't take the first three chapters of the Bible seriously, you undermine the whole Bible. You know, you, you're basically saying you can't trust any of the Bible. And I'm just not sure that's the case. I think that um, the Genesis 1 to 3 story is not a scientific textbook. It's, it's allegory, it's metaphor, it's, it's poetic, um, but it clearly says a number of things which are, are true for Christians, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we can talk about how God did that, but that's kind of the irrefutable point for Christians, is that in the beginning, whether it was this many days or that many years or, or that way or that way, God created the heavens and the earth. But I'll put some more stuff up tomorrow and um, people can, if they really want to get into that, have a look. Maybe one more and then we'll finish. Well, that might be a good point to it? finish because that is that, all. That is it. <laughs> Thanks everyone and uh, we're going to sing and we're going to sing a great song, which I think is a great song. <laughs>